In this video I will show you how you can calculate the amount of free moving charges in a piece of copper wire such as this one here in a few very simple steps. I will show you how to properly combine the atomic weight of copper, the Avogadro constant and the elementary charge into a very simple and comprehensible equation. And from this we can easily understand what current is, what voltage is and also what resistance actually means and which we can also use to derive the famous Ohm's law. My name is Andreas from the Fearless Engineer and here we go. We have already seen in the previous video that the electrons in an atom are bound to the protons in the nucleus by the so-called Coulomb force. And the further away from the nucleus the electrons are, the weaker this force becomes. And the electrons in the outermost parameter are called valence electrons. And those are the electrons that participate in bonding with other atoms. And when several copper atoms form a bond, with each other, they arrange themselves in such a way that each copper atom gives up one single valence electron. And this is free to move in between the atoms, it is free to move in the space in between the lattice, the grid, which is formed by the copper atoms. And these electrons are also called free charge carriers and they can easily be moved in a specific direction by exposing them to an electric field. In the next few minutes we will calculate the number of free charges in a piece of wire such as this one here of which we know the diameter, the length and the material it is made of. And by the end of the video we will have a simple equation from which we can already guess the basic form of Ohm's law. And as soon as we have talked about current and voltage in the next video, the path to voltage equals resistance times current can easily be seen by you. And if you're interested you can also download all the slides you see in my videos as well as the circuit diagrams from my website at thefearlessengineer.com for free. The link is down below in the video description. This video is part of a basic course in electronics and if you feel like watching the other parts of it as well, you can find the corresponding playlist in the description down below as well as on my channel. And if you feel like it, then please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to ring the bell because like this you know immediately when the next video goes online. Oh and by the way, if you have any questions, you do not understand something, then just click pause and write a comment down below, I'm happy to help you. And now let's start with the question of how much free charge we can find in a piece of wire. Now for the vast majority of problems we encounter, whether it is in electronics or in physics or in math, it makes sense to write down the known and unknown quantities. And this usually makes it much easier to get an early glimpse of the solution we are looking for. And this is just what we will do now. And first we write down what we know about the conductor. We want to take a standard household insulation cable as an example, which usually has a cross section of around 2.5 square millimeters. From the last video we already know some properties of copper and we know that we can find out the atomic weight of copper from the periodic table of elements. And if we look into it we find that it is 63.546 grams per mole of copper. And as a quick reminder for you, one mole corresponds to about 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms. And also for this task we need the density of copper and according to Google this is 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, now we've written down almost everything we need to know and the only thing missing is the elementary charge which equals to 1.602 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. And last but not least we write down what we are looking for which is the number of free charges Q within the length of the wire. In the previous tutorial we have already figured out the number of free electrons in a copper coin but the difference to our new task was that we had been given the weight of the coin which we don't have now. So instead of the weight we now have to use the cable volume as well as the density of copper to arrive at the number of charges. And in the first step we will now calculate the number of atoms in one cubic meter of copper and in the second step we will transfer the result to the piece of wire using a simple rule of three. When we take a look at the list of given quantities, we can find two which are related by their units. It's the atomic weight at 63.546 grams per mole and the density at 8.96 grams per cubic centimeters. And in both quantities, the unit gram can be found. And when we divide the density by the atomic weight, we have a result with a unit mole per cubic centimeter. And in order to convert from cubic centimeter to cubic meter, we also have to multiply by 10 to the power of 6, which gives us 141 times 10 to the power of 3 mole per cubic meter, which is about 8.49 times 10 to the power of 28 copper atoms, which exist in one cubic meter of copper. We have already learned in the last video that there is one free electron per copper atom in the conductor and thus the number of atoms for copper corresponds to the number of free charges. And this result is also called charge carrier density. Oh and by the way, if we had another material, we would have to reckon with a different number of free electrons per atom. In the case of aluminum, for example, this would be three instead of one with copper. 
And next we calculate how many free electrons we actually have in our copper cable. And to do this we only have to multiply the charge carrier density from the last step, that is the number of electrons per cubic meter of copper, by the volume of the wire which is given in cubic meters. Our piece of wire can best be described as a lengthy cylinder with a cross-sectional area A and a length L. And the volume of the wire is then simply A times L. And if we multiply this by the charge carrier density, we have the number of free electrons in our wire. So we write down A times L times NA. And now we are almost finished because our goal is to calculate the total amount of free charge in the wire. And since we now already know how many free electrons there are, we only have to multiply this number by the elementary charge. And if we now plug in the numerical values given in the example into our equation, we get Q, the charge, equals 1.602 times 10 to the power of minus 19 Coulomb, multiplied with 2.5 times 10 to the power of minus 6 square meters, multiplied with 1 meter, multiplied with 8.49 times 10 to the power of 28 meters to the power of minus 3. And this equals to 34 times 10 to the power of 3 Coulomb, and thus to the amount of charge that is distributed throughout the conductor in the form of freely moving electrons. And if you wanted to work out the number of charges, let's say, of a piece of aluminum wire instead of copper, you can do it the exact same way. You just take the atomic weight from the table of elements, you take the density, for example, from Google, and then you just have to recall that aluminum has three valence electrons instead of one which are released during bonding and which now form the electron gas cloud. And if you calculate correctly, you will arrive at 1.808 times 10 to the power of 29 electrons per cubic meter for Na and a total charge of 72.4 times 10 to the power of 3 Coulomb for the aluminum conductor of the same dimensions. That is about twice as many free charges as for the copper wire. So far we have assumed that all free charges are more or less at rest, but if we now assume that the charges move into the same direction at a certain speed, then a temporal aspect needs to be added to the equation we already have for Q, and we can calculate the amount of charge per time that moves through the conductor. And to do this we simply divide the equation for Q on both sides by a time t, thus providing us with a charge per time instant, which is Q divided by t equals E minus times A times L times NA divided by T. And you should really remember this equation here because it will be the basis for the definition of current and voltage in the next video and even for the electrical resistance as well as Ohm's law later in the course. And the question is of course which numerical value for T should be used here. Is it one second? Is it one minute? Is it one hour? And the answer is actually really simple. T is the time it takes the electrons to travel over the entire length of the wire. And so the time is naturally dependent on the drift velocity, on the drift speed of the electrons, which in turn depends on both the electron mobility in copper and on an electric field E that causes the charge carriers to move in the first place. In this tutorial we have computed how many free charge carriers there are in one piece of copper wire. And to do this we have first looked at the charge carrier density using the density and atomic weight of copper and then multiplied it by the wire volume. And also we have started to think about moving charges and thus about a time component and an electric field which causes the movement. And exactly these two aspects will lead us to a very simple definition of both current and voltage which we will take a look at in the next video. And if you like this video, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click the bell of course because then you'll know immediately when the next video goes online. And also you can find all the slides and circuit diagrams and learning materials from my videos on my website at thefearlessengineer.com for free for you to download. So have fun and see you next time here on The Fearless Engineer.